Okay, so we are continuing with calculating determinants by Gauss reduction. So where were we in here? Done all the theory. We've done at least one example, then this example, then this example. Ah, now we have some more stuff. Okay, definition. The transpose of a matrix A, written A transpose, the transpose, the A transpose, the transpose of A, is created by interchanging rows and columns. Okay, swapping rows and columns. So, for example, if A equals 1, 4, 7, 2, 5, 8, 3, 6, 9, then A transpose is, sorry, well, it's rows are the columns of A, so the rows are 1, 4, 7, 2, 5, 8, 3, 6, 9. Now, the determinant of a matrix is equal to the determinant of its transpose. The determinant of A equals the determinant of A transpose. This is easy to see for two by two matrices. You can just do it out, you know, A, D minus B, C compared to top rows and columns, and you'll have A, D minus C, B, which is the same as C times B, the same as B times C. The three by three matrix expanding along the first row of a matrix and the first column of this transpose produce the same answer. We use the result for two by two matrices to rearrange the intermediate calculation. So we can expand along the first row, A, B, C, if A, B, C, and obviously plus, minus, plus, and then you have the minus E, H, F, I, E, H, F, I, D, G, F, I, D, G, E, H. But then you can take the transpose. We've just proved, we've shown that it works that for two by two matrices you can swap the transpose. So now we, you can, the transpose is the same determinant. So we take the transpose of this matrix, which is that. Transpose of this is that, transpose of this is that. They're the same determinant, right? Then now we have A, B, A minus B and C and these things. But this is the same as if you expand along the first column of this matrix, A, B, C, with the minus E, F, H, I, D, F, G, I, and E, F, G, H, which are these, these, and these. So this is the same as if you calculate the determinant by going on the first column of the transpose. This is the transpose of this matrix. So this proves the case for 3 by 3 matrices. And for 4x4, four four, you can use the result for 3x3 three three and, and so on and so forth. OK. So this is true for any size matrix. Now, since the, since the determinant of A equals the determinant of A transpose, all the previous facts about rows are also true for columns. So what facts do we have about rows that are now, we now know are true for columns? Because the determinant doesn't care about whether or not you swap the rows and columns. So the facts we have are what? Here we go. Well, if all the entries in an entire row or column of a square matrix are zero, then the term to make it zero. So you already have that written for rows and columns. Okay. If the square matrix B is obtained from A by scaling one row of A by the constant K, well, so now we know it's also true that this is also true if you scale one column of the matrix A by the constant K, then the determinant changes by being multiplied by that constant. Here we have another one. If the matrix B is obtained from A by swapping two rows, so we also now know it's true that you swap two columns of A, then the determinant picks up a negative sign. If two rows of a square matrix are identical, so now we know that if two columns of a square matrix are identical, then the determinant is zero. If one row of a square matrix is a scalar multiple of another row, then the determinant of that matrix is zero. So now I also know that if one column of a square matrix is a scalar multiple of another column, then the determinant of the matrix is zero. If A, B, and C are square matrices, except, identically except for their, uh, that was a cue from a, thinking about things previously, thinking about this, uh, applying this fact 2.7 to fact 2.8. So if A, B, and C are square matrices, identical except for their pth column, where, what well, now we need the column, so now we know that C is the C, J, P, pth column equals A, J, P plus B, J, P. So the column is a, is that column is a sum of the columns of B, A and B then the determinant of C equals the determinant of A plus the determinant of B. We now know that if the matrix B is obtained from A by adding K times K times column P to column Q, then the determinant of B equals the determinant of A. Okay, so in, other, uh, so in, in that, the th what we just went through were the three uh, Gauss reduction or row reduction steps. And so we now could see that 
you can also, when you, you can, when you touch the matrix, you can determine the matrix, you can do row reduction, but you can also do column reduction. You can apply the same things you do to a column, you do to a row, to a column, to the columns. And if that seems easier, then you should do that. You know, sometimes there's a step, you can see a good thing, a good way of like, adding one column to another to get the column to, that column to become zero or something, and you can't see how to do it for rows, and then you can, but we know now, because the determinant of A equals the determinant of the transpose, all the things we say about columns, that rows of this are true for columns for these four matrices, for cutting the determinants, so you can use column reduction as well as row reduction. Okay, now we have, if A and B are both N by N, then the determinant of A times B equals the determinant of A times the determinant of B. Please remember that this is not true. The determinant of A plus that the determinant of A plus B is not in general equal to the determinant of A plus the determinant of B. Right? That's not true. What's what's true is that if you have if C is the same as A, if A, B, and C are all the same, and one of the rows of C is a is a sum of the two rows of A, then then, then that's true, right? But in but what's not true is is that. Okay. However, for multiplication, it is, it is the case that the determinant of A times B equals the determinant of A times the determinant of B. So the determinant like, preserves multiplication, but it doesn't preserve addition. Okay. I mean, another thing we also know is that the determinants... Oh, no, we don't know that yet. Okay. By the way, it's also not true that it preserves... It preserves vector multiplication. I mean, it preserves matrix multiplication, right? The determinant of A times B equals the determinant of A times the determinant of B. But you know, it's not true that the determinants of Ka... It's not in general equal to the k times the determinant of a, right? What's true is that if you take a and you multiply one of its rows by k, then you get k times the determinant of a, but if you multiply the whole matrix by k, no, you don't get k times the determinant of a. So be careful with those things. Of course, if you do calculate the determinant of k times a, right, that times in a by matrix a by k is the same as times in every single row of a by k. So you're going to get k to the n times the determinant of a, where n is the number of rows of the, in the matrix, which is obviously the same as the number of columns, because you can only calculate the determinants of square matrices. OK, that's not true. But the determinant of a times b does equal the determinant of a times b. It says that the explanation of proof is too long, but you should be able to convince yourself that this is true for two diagonal or upper-lower triangular matrices. So. If you take, let's take, uh, let's start off with diagonal matrices. So let's have A and B being diagonal. Okay. A and B are diagonal. So now, what is A times B? So A looks like this. One, A, two, two, A and N, and everything else is all the other entries are zero. So you can just write, put zeros there to indicate that all the other entries are zero. And you have B11, B22, BNN, and all the other entries are zero. Now if you do this multiplication, what you get? First row becomes A11 times B11. But then, and then the rest of it is zeros times zeros. Then the next, then row one, column two, we just have A11 times zero, then zero times B22, and then zero times zeros, so zero. And if you're carrying like this, you're going to get A22, B22 in here, but zero here. In general, you get zeros everywhere except for the diagonal. Multiply two diagonal matrices by each other, you get a diagonal matrix. So it's the diagonals are these, this product, and here we have zeros. So now the determinant of a diagonal matrix is the diagonal, or it's the product of all the diagonal. So you can see that the determinant of a will be A11 times A22 and so on. And the determinant of B will be B11 times B and so on. And so you can see that the determinant of A times B is going to be A11 times B11, A times A times 2 times B22, and so on until you get to ANN times BNN. And that's just going to be, so let me, set, let me put determinant of this thing, it's the determinant of that thing. So it's going to be A11 times B11, A22 times B22, all the way to ANN times BNN, which of course is A11, A2. You can rearrange that multiplication, right? Grouping all the A's, grouping all the B's, and now what you have is the determinant of A 
times the determinant of b. Okay, so we've proved this rule, this product rule, for the case of diagonal matrices. Now we want to do it for upper triangular matrices. So now we don't have zeros there necessarily. We have we can have non-zero entries there. Okay, and similar for the b, we can have non-zero entries above the diagonal, but still zero entries. All well, entries below the diagonal are still zero. Okay. Now when you multiply the first column, the, when you multiply, you want to get the first, you want to get the entry in the, you want to get row one, column one of these, of A times B. You do the first row times the first column of B, and you're going to get A11 one one times B11, one one, and then A12 times zero, A13 times zero, and so on until you have A11n one one, A one times zero. So you still just get A11, one one, B11 one one there. Then you do uh, the next row. Then you do row row one times column two. You're going to get a one one. In fact, well, you're going to get a one one. You're going to get something non-zero, like a one one times a one what a what you're going to get a one one times b one two plus a one two times b two two. But it doesn't actually matter what you get, right? Because as long as this matrix that you get is upper triangular, these entries don't count for the determinant. The determinant is still just the diagonal, remember? So never mind what these entries above the diagonal are. What we only care about is the entries on the diagonal, and if we can know that the entries below the diagonal are zeros. So what do you get for, for here, for row 2, column 1? So then you have row 2 of matrix A times row 1 of column 1 of matrix B. So then you have a 0 times by B11, and then you have a22 times a 0, so you get 0. In general, you keep on getting this. For things below the diagonal, you always get zeros because you have some zeros here, the zeros here multiply by the, oops, sorry, the zeros here multiply by the non zeros here, make it 0, then the zeros here multiply by the non zeros here and stay 0. So upper triangular times upper triangular gives you upper triangular matrix. And then diagonal just becomes A, A11 times A, B11, A22 times B22, right? Because on the diagonal, you get, you know, A22 multiplied by the B22. Everything else is zero, is zero times something. It's an A times zero or zero times B. So the diagonal becomes this product again, and so the determinant is the product. Okay. And... I'm not going to bother doing it. Well, for lower triangular, something a symmetric sort of argument applies, right? Lower triangular times lower triangular will give you lower triangular. Okay. It's not so important for lower triangular, though, because we always, we're always reducing things to upper triangular matrices. Okay. Oh, now, so we, we proved this thing now for, for upper triangular matrices. Now, the, the, the actual proof of this theorem for matrices in general involves using Gauss reduction to reduce the matrix into an upper triangular form, then apply the theorem for upper triangular, and then the things work out, right? So you reduce, basically you reduce the A and the B to upper triangular, and then that means the AB will be upper triangular, and you, what you do to reduce the A and the B, it happens over here as well, and so it all works out. But I'm not gonna, it says that the full explanation will be too long, so I'm not gonna bother doing that.